today. We're going to go into some deeper aspects of the Dhamma. The Sutta I'm reading is Majjhima Nikaya 43, Maha Vedala Sutta, the greater series of questions and answers. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jetta's Grove in Anapapindakas Park. Then, when it was evening, the Venerable Maha Kotita rose from meditation, went to the Venerable Sariputta, and exchanged readings with him. So, Maha Kotita was another Arahat, and of course, Sariputta was also an so now this dialogue is between two fully awakened beings and the question and answers one question is asked, asked by Mahakotita and then it's answered by Sariputta but it's not like Mahakotita needs to know these answers he already knows the answers this is like a like a modern day fireside chat you know between two experts so their students are listening to them have a chat. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and said to the Venerable Sariputta, One who is unwise, one who is unwise, this said friend. With reference to what is it said, one who is unwise. One does not wisely understand. One does not wisely understand. That is why it is said, one who is unwise. And what does one wisely understand? One does not wisely understand, this is suffering. One does not wisely understand, this is the origin of suffering. One does not wisely understand, this is the cessation of suffering. One does not wisely understand. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. One does not wisely understand. One does not wisely understand, friend. That is why it is said, one who is unwise. So one does not wisely understand the Four Noble Truths, meaning one does not have the awareness of the Four Noble Truths in every experience, being able to apply the Four Noble Truths the same way we were talking about when we were talking about applying the framework of the Four Noble Truths to the links of dependent origination or to the hindrances or to whatever it might be. One who is wise, one who is wise is friend with reference to what is this said, one who is wise. One wisely understands, one wisely understands, friend. That is why it is said, one who is wise. What does one wisely understand? One wisely understands, this is suffering. One wisely understands, this is the origin of suffering. One wisely understands, this is the cessation of suffering. One wisely understands, this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. One wisely understands, one wisely understands, friend. This is why it is said, one who is wise. So the application of the Four Noble Truths, the ability to recognize when the First Noble Truth arises, the ability to abandon the Second Noble Truth, then the ability to experience the Third Noble Truth and then cultivate the Fourth Noble Truth. This is facilitated through the process of right effort, through the six R's. The first noble truth of suffering and the different aspects of suffering are fully understood. The different causes and conditions for suffering are fully abandoned. And one fully realizes and experiences Nirodha, the third noble truth. And one does this through the cultivation of the Eightfold Path. 
which is facilitated through right effort. Consciousness, consciousness is set, friend, with reference to what is consciousness set. It cognizes, it cognizes, friend. That is why consciousness is set. Cognizes, what does that mean, cognize? To become aware of something, to understand something. What does it cognize? It cognizes this is pleasant, it cognizes this is painful, it cognizes this is neither painful nor pleasant. It cognizes, it cognizes, friend. That is why consciousness is said. That is the utility of awareness, to become aware of quality of experiences. Just being aware of the experience, that's it. When there is a superimposition of the self into the awareness, then the awareness is taken to be me. The awareness is taken to be I. The awareness is taken to be myself, mine. But awareness arises dependent upon its object. That awareness changes. Right now, you're looking at me. Let's say that cat was coming in. You'd see that cat. The awareness switched from the awareness of me to the awareness of the cat. But it was not the same awareness. There was the awareness of me arising in dependence upon the experience of seeing me. Then when the attention moved, there's the awareness of the cat arising in dependence upon seeing the cat. In the same way, when you're meditating, there is the awareness of loving-kindness. There is the awareness of radiating compassion. There is the awareness of quiet mind. When the attention moves towards a hindrance, towards a distraction, the awareness of the object disappears. And what arises is the awareness of the distraction. Then recognizing this, recognizing this, perceiving there is a distraction, releasing the awareness from that, coming back to mind and body, relaxing, re-smiling, <coughs> and then returning back to the object. Right effort. Then the awareness of that hindrance passes away. And there is the renewal of the awareness of the object of meditation. A new awareness of the object of meditation. Now the feeling of the object of meditation, if we are to understand it based on what we were talking about yesterday, that feeling is made up of micro-moments, many, 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 many trillions of experiences. And tied to each of those many, many, many arising and passing away, there is a consciousness, an awareness of each of those. But because it's it's so fast, it feels like one fluid awareness. Wisdom and consciousness, friend, are these states conjoined? or disjoint? And is it possible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them? Wisdom, that is, the understanding of the Four Noble Truths, and the awareness of that. Are they separate or together? And is it possible to discern between the awareness and the awareness of the Four Noble Truths. Wisdom and consciousness, friend, these states are conjoined. Conjoined, not disjoined. 
and it is impossible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them. For what one wisely understands, what one wisely comprehends, that one cognizes, understanding, being aware of, comprehending, consciousness, cognition, these are all synonymous with each other. And what one cognizes, that one wisely understands. Meaning the awareness is tied to the object of awareness. When you understand the Four Noble Truths, there is an awareness of them. How else would you understand the Four Noble Truths? There has to be a cognition for you to be able to understand it. That is why these states are conjoined, not disjoined, and it is impossible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them. Now, sorry Buddha just said this. It is impossible to separate each of them. Now listen to the question of Mahaputipa. What is the difference, friend, between wisdom and consciousness? These states that are conjoined, not disjoined. The difference, friend, between wisdom and consciousness, these states that are conjoined, not disjoined, is this. Wisdom is to be fully developed. Consciousness is to be fully understood. These states are conjoined, wisdom and consciousness. But there is a difference. Wisdom is to be fully developed, meaning you have to fully understand the first noble truth, fully abandon the second noble truth, fully experience the third noble truth, fully cultivate the fourth noble truth. The awareness of cognizing the four noble truths, that is to be fully understood. Fully understood in what way? Understanding it as an aggregate that is made up of composites that is dependently arisen, therefore impermanent, therefore to be taken impersonally. This is how it is to be understood. Feeling, friend, feeling, with reference to what is feeling said. It feels, friend, it feels. That is why feeling is said. What does it feel? It feels pleasure. It feels pain. It feels neither pain nor pleasure. It feels, friends. It feels. That is why feeling is said. So here what he's saying is, consciousness is not some kind of self. Feeling is not some kind of self. Its mechanism of the mechanism of consciousness allows the mind to be aware. The mechanism of Vedana, feeling, allows the experience to be felt, to be experienced, to be sensed. Perception, perception is friend, said friend, with reference to what is perception said. It perceives, it perceives. That is why perception is said. What does it perceive? It perceives blue, it perceives yellow, it perceives red, and it perceives white. It perceives, it perceives friend. That is why perception is said. So the mechanism of perception that is there in our mind allows us to, allows the mind to label what is being experienced. Just as you would see the color red, you would recognize it as the color red. 
just as you would see this table, and you would recognize it as a table. So the mechanism of consciousness is to understand, the mechanism of feeling is to experience, and the mechanism of perception is to label what is being cognized and what is being experienced. Feeling, perception, and consciousness, friend, are these states conjoined or disjoined? And is it possible to separate each of these states from the others in order to describe the difference between them? Feeling, perception, and consciousness, friend, these states are conjoined not disjoint. And it is impossible to separate each of these states from the others in order to describe the difference between them. For what one feels, that one perceives. And what one perceives, that one cognizes. That is why these states are conjoined, not disjoint. And it is impossible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them. What you experience, as soon as you see the color red, the mechanism of perception says that is red. And you understand and cognize it as an experience of seeing red. What one feels, what one experiences, that one immediately labels. And that one immediately understands to be there. This is a pleasant feeling. This is an unpleasant feeling. This is a neutral feeling. So feeling, perception, consciousness, these three run around each other. Using the example of one who puts the hand over the stove fire. You put your hand on the stove fire. You feel warmth. That's the experience. This is warmth. You perceive that it feels warm. In other words, it feels, you feel the heat and you're able to label it as being heat. You say it is warm. That is the perception. The cognition of that, the understanding that this process is warm. That's the cognition. That's the consciousness. And then the fire gets hotter and it becomes painful. Then you perceive it, so you experience the pain, you perceive it as painful, and understand that it is painful. These three states are interlaced within each other. Feeling, perception, and consciousness. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one Cognizes. Friend, what can be known by purified mind consciousness released from the five faculties? What is beyond the experience of the five physical sense bases? Friend, by purified mind consciousness, purified in what way? Free from hindrances. Meaning that mind is in a jhanic state of mind. Free from hindrances. Friend, by purified mind consciousness released from the five faculties, the base of infinite space can be known thus. Space is infinite. The base of infinite consciousness can be known thus. Consciousness is infinite. And the base of nothingness can be known thus. There is nothing. Meaning, when the mind is detached from the experience of the five physical sense bases, when you are meditating, in the first four jhanas, you still feel some contact with the body. You still can experience things. 
But then eventually you go deep into your mind. You might still hear things. But there is the awareness of infinite space. There is the awareness of infinite consciousness. There is the awareness of nothingness. Because it's, first of all, it's purified from the five hindrances. Purified of the five hindrances. So now it's in the jhanic state of mind. That mind consciousness is just aware of mind itself, the experiences of mind. And for that reason, it can experience infinite space, infinite consciousness, and nothingness. Friend, with what does one understand a state that can be known? Friend, with what does one understand a state that can be known? What is the tool? What is it that sees? What is it that understands what is perceivable, what can be known, what can be understood. What is that? Friend, one understands a state that can be known with the eye of wisdom. Panya chakra. The eye of wisdom. This eye of wisdom, or the eye of the Dhamma, or however you want to put it, is not some kind. It is not some kind of pervasive consciousness. That's the substratum of everything. That eye of wisdom that understands arises as and when the experience arises. So in other words, the observer, that which observes an experience, that which observes what can be known, the observer arises dependent upon the object of observation. The knower arises, the notion of the knower is superimposed upon the process of knowing. Friend, what is the purpose of wisdom? That's a fair question. Why are we doing all of this? The purpose of wisdom, friend, is direct knowledge. Its purpose is full understanding. Its purpose is abandoning. Wisdom is not gained for the sake of knowledge, for the sake of some kind of thing that you can show off. Wisdom is gained for direct knowledge. Direct knowledge of what? Nibbana. The cessation of suffering. Full understanding of what suffering and abandoning of what the causes and conditions that lead to suffering. When there is wisdom, there is immediate automatic understanding of what is suffering, immediate automatic letting go of the causes and conditions of suffering, an immediate and automatic experience and realization of Nibbana. Friend, how many conditions are there for the arising of right view? Right view is synonymous with wisdom, samaditi. Right view meaning the full understanding and grasp of the Four Noble Truths. Friend, there are two conditions for the arising of right view. The voice of another and 
and wise attention. These are the two conditions for the arising of right view. The voice of another. The time of the Buddha, that was the Buddha's voice. Or the disciple of the Buddha. In today's world, it's YouTube. <laughs> Somebody to point out the way. <coughs> that this is right view. That way you know what is right view, at least on an intellectual level. And wise attention. Yoni so manasikara. Attention rooted in reality. Seeing things as they actually are. Recognizing when mind takes something to be permanent and letting go of that and seeing the impermanence. Recognizing when the mind sees something personal, letting go of that and understanding its impersonal nature. Friend, by how many factors is right view assisted when it has deliverance of mind for its fruit? Deliverance of mind for its fruit and benefit. When it has deliverance by wisdom, for its fruit. Deliverance by wisdom for its fruit and benefit. Deliverance of mind. Cheto Vimuti. And deliverance by wisdom. Panya Vimuti. Let's understand what these two terms actually mean. Cheto Vimuti is when somebody goes through the first four jhanas, then goes through the formless attainments, goes through cessation, and then experiences the destruction of the taints. Deliverance by mind. Panya Vimuti is when somebody goes just through the first four jhanas, experiences cessation, and experiences the destruction of the kings. This is the difference. One experiences the first four jhanas in Panya Vimuti, and then experiences the destruction of the kings. One goes through each of the eight jhanas, then experiences the destruction of the kings. That is Chaito Vimuti. So the question here is, how many factors is right view assisted when its benefit and its effect are deliverance of mind and deliverance of wisdom. Meaning, the effect of right view is ultimately the destruction of the taints. So how many factors assist it? How many factors help it facilitate that? Friend, right view is assisted by five factors. When it has deliverance of mind for its fruit, deliverance of mind for its fruit and benefit. When it has deliverance by wisdom for its fruit, and deliverance by wisdom for its fruit and benefit. Here, friend, right view is assisted by virtue. Sila. Keeping your precepts, learning, attending Dhamma talks, watching YouTube videos, <laughs> reading the suttas, discussion, questions and answers, discussing the tongue, serenity, samatha, and insight, vipassana. So, virtue, sila, learning, discussion, serenity or samatha, and insight or vipassana. Right view is assisted by these five factors and has deliverance of mind for its fruit, 
deliverance of mind for its fruit and benefit, deliverance uh, by mind, uh, by wisdom for its fruit, and deliverance by wisdom for its fruit and benefit. Friend, how many kinds of being are there? How many kinds of existences are there? How many kinds of ways of becoming are there? How many types or categories under which habitual tendencies are present? There are these three kinds, friend. Sense, sphere, being, fine, material being, and immaterial being. Sense, sphere, being. In the context of the cosmology of the Tao. Yeah, that starts from the hell realms all the way up to the sixth central heaven. This comprises of the sense sphere beings. And then from there, the first Brahmaloka all the way up to the fourth Brahmaloka. This constitutes the material being, fine material being, luminous beings. And then from infinite space all the way to neither perception or non perception that constitutes the immaterial beings. When I spoke about habitual tendencies the other day, this is what we were referring to. The mind has certain kinds of habitual tendencies that can be hellish and create psychological hell. That has deva-like tendencies that can create deva-like existence in the same way. Deva-like psychological states like being generous, compassionate, forgiving, patient, and so on. As you cultivate the jhanas, you start to cultivate Brahma-like tendencies, depending upon which jhana. Likewise, when you cultivate the formless attainments, you cultivate immaterial-like tendencies or psychological states. Friend, how is renewal of being in the future generated. The renewal of being. How are the renewal of these habitual tendencies? How do they come about? Friend, renewal of being in the future is generated through the delighting in this and that on the part of beings who are hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. It's a very important phrase to understand. Hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. When the samkaras, the samskaras, the mental formations, are fettered by craving and influence, conditioned by ignorance, then that can give rise to the potential for craving, sensual craving, craving for existence, craving for non-existence. Acting upon that, there can be clinging and then becoming or being or habitual tendencies. Friend, how is renewal of being, the renewal of these habitual tendencies in the future not generated? How do you stop the generation of these habitual tendencies? Friend, with the fading away of ignorance, with the arising of true knowledge, and with the cessation of craving, renewal of being in the future is not generated. The fading away of ignorance, how does that happen? Through awareness, observation, mindfulness, attention, being aware and attentive of what's going on allows you to get a deeper understanding of the impermanent nature of things through seeing dependent origination, which then lets you lets you see with right view. And so there is a fading away of ignorance replaced by right view, replaced by wisdom. The arising of true knowledge is just that, the seeing into the links of dependent origination. And the cessation of craving, 
letting go of all craving. That is facilitated through having complete, pristine mindfulness of every moment, of every experience. Seeing that it is conditioned, therefore impermanent, therefore not to be taken as me, mine, or myself. By seeing it in this way, every feeling, every experience, no potential through the underlying tendencies can arise, and there cannot be the arising of craving, clinging, and being, or becoming. Friend, what is the first jhana? Here, friend, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. This is called the first jhana. By now everybody understands that, right? This is the first jhana. Mind is secluded from unwholesome states, no hindrances. Quite secluded from sensual pleasures, staying in the mind, not paying attention to what's going on, not getting your attention scattered through the sense bases. Enters upon the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought, starting the process of bringing up the object of meditation and resting your mind on the object of meditation. With rapture and pleasure born of seclusion, letting go of the hindrances provides relief. From that relief there is joy and happiness and comfort in the body. Friend, how many factors does the first jhana have? Friend, the first jhana has five factors. Here, when a bhikkhu has entered upon the first jhana, there occurred applied thought, sustained thought. So, bringing up the object, staying with the object, rapture, the joy, the peeping, pleasure, comfort in the body, and unification of mind, ekagata. Letting the mind not be uh, dispersed. The mind's attention is not dispersed, not refracted, but rather collected, orbiting around its object of meditation. This that is how the first jhana has five factors. Friend, how many factors are abandoned in the first jhana and how many factors are possessed? What do you think? How many factors are abandoned in the five in, in the uh, oh I just told you. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, what five factors are abandoned? Hindrances. Hindrances. Friend, in the first jhana, five factors are abandoned and five factors are possessed. Here, when a bhikkhu has entered upon the first jhana, sensual desire is abandoned, ill will is abandoned, sloth and torpor are abandoned, restlessness and remorse are abandoned, and doubt is abandoned. And these, uh, and there occur, again, the applied thought, the thinking, the bringing up of the object, the sustained thought, staying with the object of meditation, rapture, the bliss, the happiness, pleasure, comfort in the body, and unification of mind, the kāgata. That is how the first jhana, that is how in the first jhana, five factors are abandoned and five factors are possessed. Friend, these five faculties each have a separate field, a separate domain, and do not experience each other's field and domain. That is, the eye faculty, the ear faculty, the nose faculty, the tongue faculty, and the body faculty. Now, of these five faculties, each having a separate field, a separate domain, not experiencing each other's field and domain, what is their resort? What experiences their fields and domains? I do want to bring up something here. So what he's saying is that the I only experiences 
the different forms. The ear only experiences the different sounds. The nose only experiences the different smells. The tongue experiences the different tastes. And the body experiences different touches. But there is something known as synesthesia. Where the eye apparently can see smells or see sounds. Or the ear can hear smells or hear tastes. Or the nose can smell sights. Or the tongue can taste sounds. <laughs> yeah, it can happen under certain kinds of influences, but there are some people who actually have inborn synesthesia. But regardless, they're still experiencing it through those sense faculties. The idea here is, or the question here is, what is their resort? What is it that experiences their fields and domains? Friends, these five faculties each have a separate field, a separate domain, and do not experience each other's field and domain. That is, the eye faculty, the ear faculty, the nose faculty, the tongue faculty, and the body faculty. Now, these five faculties, each having a separate field, a separate domain, not experiencing each other's field and domain, have mind as their resort. Mind experiences their fields and domains. Like we said earlier, mind is chief. Mind is the forerunner of all states. Ultimately, everything that you're experiencing, the mind is experiencing. Even the concept that you have a body is experienced through the mind. As to these five faculties, that is the eye faculty, the ear faculty, the nose faculty, the tongue faculty, and the body faculty, what do these faculties stand in dependence upon? What are they dependent upon? Friend, as to these five faculties, that is the eye faculty, the ear faculty, the nose faculty, the tongue faculty, and the body faculty. These five faculties stand in dependence on vitality. Vitality. We were talking about this yesterday, life faculty. So that is the, so here it's, uh, it's translated from the word I-U, A-Y-U, I-U. But that's another word for Jivit Indriya. And I did some uh, contemplation on this. And in the Abhidhamma, it talks about two types of Jivit Indriya. There is the Nama Jivit Indriya, and there is the Rupa Jivit Indriya. So, we were talking about this, that the eye faculty is dependent, or the eye and the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, they're all dependent upon this life faculty. Then the question arises, what does vitality stand in dependence on? Vitality stands in dependence on heat. Friend, what does heat stand in dependence on? Heat stands in dependence on vitality. Just now, friend, we understood the Venerable Sariputta to have said, vitality stands in dependence on heat. And now we understand him to say, heat stands in dependence on vitality. How should the meaning of these statements be regarded? You just told me that vitality stands in dependence on heat, and now you're telling me heat stands in dependence on heat, on, on vitality. How am I supposed to understand this? In that case, friend, I shall give you a simile. For some wise men here understand the meaning of a statement by means of a simile. Just as when an oil lamp is burning, its radiance is seen in dependence on its flame. 
and its flame is seen in dependence on its radiance. So too vitality stands in dependence on heat, and heat stands in dependence on vitality. Friend, are vital formations things that can be felt, or vital formations one thing and things that can be felt another? Vital formations. I use some cards. I use some cards. Vital formation, formations, friends, are not things that can be felt. If vital formations were things that can be felt, then a bhikkhu who has entered upon the cessation of perception and feeling could not be seen to emerge from it, because vital formations are one thing and things that can be felt another. A bhikkhu enters who has entered upon the cessation of perception and feeling can be seen to emerge from it. In other words, what he's saying is, if vital formations were things to be felt, they would be part of mental formations, because through mental formations one can feel and perceive. But vital formations are separate. So you have bodily formations, verbal formations, and mental formations. In the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, mental formations cease. But if vital formations were something to be felt, then they would be consolidated with mental formations. They would be part of mental formations, because they would be felt. But they are not felt in the sense that all of the different bodily processes, like the cellular activity, like blood pressure, like all of the different vital signs that we have, all of those things are not necessarily always under our control. Although certain yogis can do that. But they're not always being, you're not always aware of them, unless you put your attention to them. Like in the eighth jhana, you become aware of your heartbeat, but you, or you might hear your blood flow, so they say, so some people experience. But vital formations are those that maintain the longevity of the body, i.e. use some kinds. They are separate to mental formations that allow us to experience through the six sense spaces, perceive through the six sense spaces. So when there is a cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, there is a cessation of bodily formations, there is a cessation of verbal formations, and there is a cessation of mental formations. But the Ayu Sankaras, those continue. Those Ayu Sankaras are basically the heat and vitality that we're talking about. That continues. And we'll see why. It says your friend, when this body is bereft of how many states is it then discarded and forsaken, left lying senseless like a log, meaning when the body is dead, there is no more life process in the body. Friend, when this body is bereft of three states, vitality, heat, and consciousness, it is then discarded and forsaken, left lying senseless like a log. Friend, what is the difference between one who is dead, who has completed his time, and a bhikkhu who has entered upon the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness? Friend, in the case of one who is dead, who has completed his time, his bodily formations have ceased. There's no more inhalation, exhalation going on, for example. His verbal formations have ceased. There's no more thinking and reflecting in the mind. And his mental formations have ceased and subsided. There's no more ability for the body to feel and perceive, the mind to feel and perceive. Rather. His vitality is exhausted. There's no more life principle in the body. No more, no more bodily processes that maintain homeostasis in the body. Maintain the life in the body. Gone. Exhausted. His heat has been dissipated. 
when you touch your dead body, it's cold. It doesn't maintain the same heat that we possess as living beings. And his faculties are fully broken up. The sense spaces no longer experience anything. No longer are able to make contact. Because there's no consciousness there. In the case of a bhikkhu who has entered upon the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, his bodily formations have ceased and subsided. His verbal formations have ceased and subsided. His mental formations have ceased and subsided. But his vitality is not exhausted. The bodily processes that maintain the temperature of the body, maintain homeostasis in the body, continue. Life is still present in that body. His heat has not been dissipated. And his faculties become exceptionally clear. The sense spaces, although are not active, they are exceptionally clear. Why? When you are experiencing whatever it is you are experiencing, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, the mind, they are always bombarded by a traffic jam of sensory data, impeded by sensory data. But when there is cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, the six sense bases are active, dependent upon the vitality and the heat, but there is no more sensory data being presented to them, or no more sensory data being received by them. There's no traffic going on there. That's why they are exceptionally clear. No traffic jams going on. This is the difference between one who is dead, who has completed his time, and a bhikkhu who has entered upon the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. Now we are going to talk about the different liberations of the mind, including the emptiness liberation. This is known as deliverance of mind. Friend, how many conditions are there for the attainment of the neither painful nor pleasant deliverance of mind? What does that mean? Neither painful nor pleasant deliverance of mind. Total equanimity. This is the fourth jhana. Friend, there are four conditions for the attainment of the neither painful nor pleasant deliverance of mind. Here, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. These are the four conditions for the attainment of the neither painful nor pleasant deliverance of mind. The jhanas are also known as liberations because they are temporary liberations. While you are in a jhanic state, your mind is liberated from craving, liberated from any kind of aversion, liberated from restlessness, liberated from sloth and torpor, liberated from doubt. So anytime craving does arise, you are not in jhana. Anytime uh, any hindrance arises, you are not in jhana. So how do you come back to jhana? Six hours. Friend, how many conditions are there for the attainment of the signless deliverance of mind? We talked about this, jhana 8.5. The signless collectedness of mind. How many conditions are there for that attainment? Friend, there are two conditions for the attainment of the signless deliverance of mind. Listen to this. Non-attention to all signs and attention to the signless element. What is the signless element? mind. So when you are in the signless collectedness of mind, what happens? 
your mind starts to, your, the edges of your mind start to dissolve. Your awareness is not landing on anything. Not attention to all objects. But there is attention. Attention to what? Reality. Imbued in reality. Just the awareness of the self. You can't possess it. There's no object there. It's just awareness. The awareness that's looking but not looking at anything. Resting in that awareness. The awareness of awareness. These are the two conditions for the attainment of the signless deliverance of mind. Friend, how many conditions are there for the persistence of the signless deliverance of mind? Friend, there are three conditions for the persistence of the signless deliverance of mind. Non-attention to all signs, attention to the signless element, and the prior determination of its duration. So this is an attainment. When we say it's an attainment, which means that the mind is able to go at it at will. Go at any jhana at will. And be able to determine how long to be in that state. So, people have kind of stumbled into, for this retreat, that signless collectedness of mind. As you start to perfect your understanding and awareness and experience of it, and as you start to develop your ability to, to do determinations, then you can attain to it, and that's an attainment. That's another bragging right that you can put up there, and say, I can attain the signless collectedness of mind. Friend, how many conditions are there for emergence from the signless deliverance of mind? Friend, there are two conditions for the emergence from the signless deliverance of mind. What do you think? You need the attention to an object, attention to all signs. So now you take an object. And non-attention to the signless element. So you don't become aware of the awareness, you become aware of the object of its attention. These are the two conditions for emergence from the signless deliverance of mind. Friend, the immeasurable deliverance of mind. The deliverance of mind through nothingness. The deliverance of mind through emptiness. The deliverance, the signless deliverance of mind. Are these states different in meaning and different in name? Or are they one in meaning and different only in name? In other words, are these states that I've just described, just told you? The immeasurable deliverance of mind, the deliverance of mind through nothingness, the deliverance of mind through emptiness, and the signless deliverance of mind. Are they synonymous with each other, or are they different states that are being described? Friend, the immeasurable deliverance of mind, the deliverance of mind through nothingness, the deliverance of mind through emptiness, and the signless deliverance of mind. Listen to this. There is a way in which these states are different in meaning and different in name, and there is a way in which they are one in meaning and different only in name. You can never get a straight answer out of an arahant. <laughs> what friend is the way in which these states are different in meaning and different in name? Here, so now how are these states different in terms of they have different names, but they're also different in terms of their qualities? They are different states. How are they different? Here, one abides pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth, as above, below, around, and everywhere, and to all as to himself. 
He abides pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> he abides pervading the world imbued with compassion, with altruistic joy, with equanimity. Likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth. So below, above, below, around, and everywhere, and to all as to himself. He abides pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with these qualities, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility, and without ill will. This is called the immeasurable deliverance of mind. So when you radiate in the six directions, for those who are doing the six directions, you, if you're doing it in a way that you're experiencing their radiating, you're experiencing the world, everything around you, including yourself, being imbued with that loving kindness, with compassion. This is that immeasurable deliverance of mind. That's the quality of the mind. And what, friend, is the deliverance of mind through nothingness? Here with the complete surmounting of the base of infinite consciousness, aware that there is nothing, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the base of nothingness. This is called the deliverance of mind through nothingness. So this is the seventh jhana, or the formless state or the ayatana of nothingness. After the rising and passing away of consciousnesses, then you start to see the gaps, and the gaps start to widen, then your awareness and perception become more, uh, more cognizing of the actual gap, which then widens and it becomes nothing. And there is no thingness. This is the deliverance of mind through nothingness. And what, friend, is the deliverance of mind through emptiness? Here, a bhikkhu gone to the forest or the root of a tree or to an empty hut reflects thus, this is empty of a self or of what belongs to a self. This is what we talked about yesterday. This is called the deliverance of mind through emptiness. One takes each of the five aggregates, each of the six sense bases, and just observes them, and then realizes this is empty of any kind of self, empty of anything belonging to what could be considered a self. Another way of looking at this, you can do this as an exercise off retreat. Although I don't know if some of you will do it on retreat or not, because some of you don't listen. But you take a thought, and then you look at how that thought arose. And then look at how the content of that arose. And then you look at how that source of that thought arose. And eventually you see that it is empty of any kind of self. The mind comes to this state which is similar to the signless collectiveness of mind, just completely quiet. Observing things as they actually are. And what, friend, is the signless deliverance of mind? They already said this. Here, with non-attention to all signs, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the signless collectedness of mind. This is called the signless deliverance of mind. This is the way in which these states are different in meaning and different in name. Meaning these are different states. And what, friend, is the way in which these states are one in meaning and different only in name? How are they synonymous? How do they point to that one singular state? Lust is a maker of measurement. Hate is a maker of measurement. Delusion is a maker of measurement. When they say maker of measurement, what does that mean? The eye-making, the ahamkara. 
the conceit. Conceit arises when I don't like something. When I like something. Or I think I am that. These three roots, greed, hatred and delusion, create that sense of I. In one whose taints are destroyed, these are abandoned, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, done away with so done away with so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Of all kinds of immeasurable deliverance of mind, the unshakable deliverance of mind is pronounced the best. Now that unshakable deliverance of mind is void of lust, empty of lust, empty of hate, empty of delusion. So in other words, when we talk about the immeasurable deliverance of mind, what we're saying is that mind, that is the mind of a fully awakened person that has no more greed, hatred, or delusion, doesn't measure things, doesn't project the idea of this is me, mine, or myself, doesn't compare in relation to a self-concept. In that way, it is immeasurable. And because it is empty of craving, empty of hatred, empty of delusion, it is empty. It experiences emptiness in that sense. Lust is a something. Hate is a something. Delusion is a something. That is to say, greed, hatred, and delusion are something in the mind. They are qualities of the mind. Or they can be qualities of the mind. In one whose kings are destroyed, these are abandoned, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, done away with so that they no longer are subject to future arising. Of all the kinds of deliverance of mind through nothingness, the unshakable deliverance of mind is pronounced the best, arahatship. Now that unshakable deliverance of mind is void of lust, void of heat, void of delusion. Lust is a maker of signs. Hate is a maker of signs. Delusion is a maker of signs. In order for greed to arise, right? when there is greed, there is also an object of that greed. When there is lust and when there is hatred, there is an object of that hatred. It doesn't have to be an external object. It can be even the mind itself. I hate myself. I hate the way I am. Those kinds of thoughts can arise too. Or delusion, ignorance of me, my, myself, taking things personally. There can be an object of that. A sign, nimitta, which is an object. These three are makers of sign. These three are makers of objects. In one whose things are destroyed, these are abandoned, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump done away with so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Of all the kinds of signless deliverance of mind, the unshakable deliverance of mind is pronounced the best, arahatship. Because the arahat no longer has any objects of greed, any objects of uh, hatred, any objects of delusion. Now that unshakable deliverance of mind is void of lust, void of hate, void of delusion. This is the way in which these states are one in meaning and different only in name. That is what the Venerable Sariputta said. The Venerable Maha Kotita was satisfied and delighted in the Venerable Sariputta's words. Any questions? Of course.
Uh, there was one uh, question which I had about uh, Sadiqatta and Sutta. Uh, the, the, there was one line in that which I didn't get, which he says for the body, he says for the mind, he also says for feelings and you know the mind objects. That in this way he avoids contemplating the body as a body internally or a body as a body externally. What is the internal and the external part of this? My body and other people's bodies. Internally and externally, or different components of the body. Uh, that makes sense for the body, but I'm, I'm, I'm not able to understand that for the, uh, feelings and the mind. Like how when you have telepathy, you will. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is, right? <laughs> There's also a, another way to understand yeah. that, too, of your reactions to things. So, like, the thing itself, and then your mind's reaction to it. Like yeah. your perception of it is the internal part, and uh, the external part would be the actual sensory data. And uh, really so, sorry, but would you be able to explain it with regard to the four four objects, which the Sutta speaks about, like like how how is this for the body, how is this for the mind, how is it for feelings and for the mind objects? I could explain in terms of the feeling. It would be the sense. So the sense. The sense base and the sense base object. Then there's the feeling dependent upon the two things. Right. Yeah. So like the object of the object itself, and then your mind's perception of it. In each case. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So you spoke about. Uh, difference between being dead and being conscious. There was an experiment done in about, I think, 1960s where they froze a hamster and then a microwave it and brought it back to life. They microwaved it? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, so they figured out a technology to freeze right. a small animal and get it back to life. Yeah. So, how do you <coughs> think it was that? So uh, the difference between one who is uh, the difference is actually between one who is uh, dead and one who is in cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. Right. So there's no consciousness in the one who also has yeah. ceased all perception, feeling, and consciousness. Only thing is they still have their bodily processes still functioning. No, so the hamster is frozen. Hamster is frozen. Kept in the freezer for two weeks. Yeah. It's dead. It's cold. There's no heat. Right. And then comes back to life. That is the way we are doing in IVF also. No? We are freezing the embryos and we are using it maybe after two years or three years. Or right, but perhaps it's slightly higher life form, so it's easier to. But then, as in my sister, would you, you say, say, would you say it's in suspended animation? I would like to consult the physicians, <laughs> if, the medical team that we have here. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say that it's in suspended animation? Yes. Yeah. The eggs are frozen. Yeah. They can be kept for many, many years. But in the case of the hamster? I don't know. Yeah. They're doing this to human bodies as well. Well, I would think that because of that, uh, maybe the hamster goes into hibernation, possibly. Because the bodily processes slow down. They're not, uh, they're not uh, what do you call, completely stopped. Yeah, that's, wow. Yeah, like yeah, that's, 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 so I was reading about this piece where they freeze human bodies and yeah. they're trying to figure out technology to bring them back to life. Uh, but uh, they could only do it to smaller objects. When you do it with larger bodies, it tends to burn. Interesting. Well, I, I would say in the case, I mean, that, that would be interesting, right? When you have cryogenic freezing, things like that, where you cryogenically freeze a body who's still alive, or that is still alive, and then wait for a hundred years until, you know, they find out they have some cure to the disease that probably has. So I think, uh, I don't know how far science has gotten there, but... Nowhere close. Yeah, nowhere close. <laughs> 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 Nothing has done quite a bit of stuff. Huh? Elon Musk is a neurologist. One more question. Uh, so, a lot of Sutras talk about uh, Devas and Nagas. 
is it symbolism or is it like permutation and combination of choices or is it like parallel existence of planes? How does how do you? So Devas and Nagas, I think if you see that sheet that we have, which is the um, right. the sharing the merit, it says a Deva is an angel and a Naga is an Arahant. But actually, uh, there's also Nagas like which are like uh, other beings. Devas are beings and Nagas are beings. Yakas are beings. Asuras are beings. Um, Kinaras are beings. I mean, there are all of these different kinds of non-human beings in the in the Buddhist cosmology. So. As for Buddhism, they exist, they're not parallel planes. I mean, they exist in the same sphere along with us. They ex yeah, they exist in the same sphere of samsara. The way I like to look at the 31 planes of existence is that they're refractions of one light. So just as you would put light through a prism and it would refract into seven different colors, the way I would see it is that they're all on one, let's say, level of existence, but different layers. So dimensions within dimensions. Within it's not symbolism like no. to look at Mara, it's very easy to look at look at Mara like symbolism. This right. is not. But that there is Mara as an actual being, that, that is also the case. So where can we understand the cosmology of Buddhism? Because we being you know, we understand what words, what is its formations? And if I want to understand Buddhism, because there are many words which come through suttas. Yeah. How can we get, how can we get the information? Uh, there was a book by um, what was his name? Puna Do you remember this? Yeah. Puna Dhamma. If you search for Puna Dhamma cosmology on YouTube, he does a great sort of analysis of, of the different planes of existence, and he also wrote a book called Buddhist Cosmos or something like that. And it's available online for free as a PDF. And in terms of the Buddhist, you said terminologies. I mean, uh, the Pali English Dictionary would be the best way of understanding some of these Pali, Pali terminologies. My favorite resource actually is suddacentral.net because it gives you uh, the different translations and Sujato's translations are great because it's both the Pali and the English together. And once you start to get a hang of Pali, you see how similar it is to the other Indic languages, Sanskrit and Hindi both. I think it's kind of cool about uh, Buddhist cosmology. Is that the math is pretty similar to certain psychedelic experiences that people have reported. And like uh, these psychonauts who take high doses of, say, LSD, like uh, Christopher Bosch, who wrote Diamonds from Heaven, and uh, Dr. John C. Lilly, uh, they kind of have a, they talk about these different planes of consciousness and being in these different places, and they describe it just as it is in the, the ancient texts. So that, that kind of gives some kind of, whether ontologically, you, I mean, you can't prove that something exists, but it's kind of cool that you can access it with in different ways and the reports seem to match up. What did you say his name was? Uh, Christopher Bosch or John Lilly? Uh, the yeah. one who, uh, both, I guess. <laughs> yeah, John C. Lilly, the inventor of the sensory deprivation tank and took high doses of LSD and ketamine and explored his mind. And he experimented and, with dolphins, right? Yeah, he, he said he could communicate with dolphins. <laughs> but he also had um, like numbers for them, and there was like six levels of hell, uh, just like in the Buddhist cosmology and different levels of, of heavenly realms. And, uh, and then Christopher Bosch did 70... Over the course of 20 years, he did 70 very high dose um, sessions of LSD and like charted that out. And that, that's in a book called Diamonds from Heaven. How high are those? I don't know. Pretty, pretty big. <laughs> <laughs>
He said he wouldn't recommend it to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I had a I had a friend uh, who will remain unnamed, who uh, is is older than me, much older than me, but he did something like. Um, 85 tabs of acid a week, just constant, like, on acid that whole month. And he, too, was exploring all of these different states, you know, he saw demons and creatures and mystical beings and all of these things, so, go figure. Oh, why did these be hallucinations? But the, the interesting thing is that they kind of mapped onto... Uh, the stuff that we see both in Vedic and Buddhist cosmology. And that the, the people who report them, there's like simultaneous reports of seeing the same thing. Yeah, there's another, there's a pretty cool story, I uh, saw this on Netflix, this guy, um, the comedian, he was taking, um, he was taking uh, DMT, and he went into this place in this realm of his mind where there was this kind of purple fairy being and he spent what felt like a really long time with her, had some kind of romantic relationship and then came down from his trip and then later on I think a couple weeks later he was with a friend he was just sitting for his friend while he took a large dose of DMT and his friend took like what he thought was way too much. He was like, whoa, I just took way too much. Like, I'm, I'm blasting off. Uh, and then at some point, his friend kind of just turns to him and says, hey, I'm seeing this uh, purple lady, and she says that she knows you really well, and she says, what's up? <laughs> so I don't know what to make of that, but that seems to imply that there's some kind of... Uh, continuing <laughs> existence of that being, that it's not just a hallucination. So we have a couple of detailed, report, detailed trip reports, and what this says, your brain cannot create new content. It mm -hmm. probably latches onto the previous content and tries to amplify that. Probably the previous trip that his friend had some interest through that. But he didn't, his friend didn't know about his <coughs> own trip. Right. Well, that's it. <coughs> uh, I was about to ask, So, uh, a lot of the things that we feel during meditation are these formations, visual and very cinematic at times, right? And I was wondering if some of these are like very subtle versions of how, when you are in a psychedelic influence, you feel. I've never tried it, so I can't say closely. But are they similar? Or are they like, do we know? Uh, they can be. Uh, because some of these formations, like I said earlier, are gateways to seeing past lives. Because some of the things that you might see, you're like, I have never experienced this before. Like, where is this memory from? Or where did this image come from? Perhaps, like you were saying, it might have been from a small inference at some point that you saw somewhere. But still, it's like, uh, they, they can be gateways into seeing past lives, for sure. This, Huxley talks about the doors of perception. Oh, yeah. he, has a, he has a book, Doors of Perception. Yeah. yeah so I think he took, it, he took it himself and tried that out. Yeah, How so it's like, see? the idea is like the brain's filtering things, and there's just a lot that we don't normally perceive, and so through meditation, uh, you know, you can kind of decondition your habitual tendencies to view the world in like a very limited way basically just taking in the information that your brain needs to survive or basically that your brain is craving for, in a sense. And then as you decondition that, all these new possibilities open up in the same way that psychedelics might do that. So if I'm not wrong, meditation also tries some, some sort of, uh, turns off the de default mode network in the brain and tries to rewire it. Is this right. where psychedelics work? Right. Wisdom eye. Huh? Wisdom eye. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about it? What is it? Uh, what are the different interpretations of the wisdom eye? How 
gets triggered and opened by Dharma talk. So when wisdom eyes open, it's like a synonymous that uh, you are entering the stream or you have like a path attainment or can you talk about it? So with the wisdom eye, the eye of wisdom or the eye of the Dharma is that which actually sees the Dharma. So, but like I said, it arises in dependence upon what it sees. So when you have the experience of cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, your mind touches the unconditioned. And then when there is consciousness arising again, for a brief moment, you become aware of the links of dependent origination. You see the links of dependent origination. That seeing, that process of seeing, is the eye of wisdom seeing it in that moment. But then that's it. It's not like it's like always there. It's just now Im- imbibed in your mind. In that sense, it's unshakable, irreversible. What you have seen is what you have seen. You can't take it out. So now you have seen for yourself that this actually is a completely impersonal process and that this thing that is created in terms of our experience happens through seeing these different conditions, which are the links of the origination. So that which sees it is called the eye of the Dhamma. That eye of the Dhamma is conditioned. It's not unconditioned. So because it's conditioned, it means it's impermanent. It arises because of what it sees. It arises in relation to what it sees. So, when an uh, arahat dies, the wisdom eye dies. It's conditioned. system uh, automatically controls circulation. Right. So that can be sort of the controller of vitality. Right. And uh, it can control the temperature and pulse and blood pressure, etc. So that makes sense that is the vitality and heat is a metabolism. But in the earlier sentence, uh, the sense bases are dependent on the vitality. Right. So the autonomic nervous system does not go, the the sense bases report to the higher higher brain, right? Not to the brain stem and the autonomic nervous systems. So what is that? Uh, so I, I just didn't follow how this works. So the the, yeah. the autonomic nervous system that is sympathetic and parasympathetic, the uh, centers are there in the stem of the brain, right? And they control the so a person can be brain dead. Right. And be fully functioning. Right. So the metabolism would be functioning, circulation would be functioning. Right. But because brain stem is functioning, the circulation is intact. Right. But the sense spaces would report to the higher centers. They will pass through the brain stem and go to the higher centers. So it doesn't. The, the, uh, the I said Yeah. Please, please. I was just going to say that I think it's worth. Also, uh, remembering that the, the Dhamma and like these teachings are from a subjective standpoint. Like someone was, you know, the Buddha in this case was looking into his own bodily processes using introspection. So it might not always perfectly map on to, you know, medical science. It's kind of, you know, it's a different vantage point. In theory, it should, should map on pretty well, but like the concepts or the way that they splice it up from the subjective standpoint, won't always perfectly match like a medical understanding of the body. But it is interesting to explore, though, I would say, because... It, it can still happen. Yeah. Why is there no identity when the sense basis won't function? Right. So, I mean... But even, so even if the person is brain dead, or their, their uh, brain stem is not functional, would the sense basis still function? Because the, there's no circulation at all, right. so the body would 
right? So, so sense base is good perish, right? I mean, through that, in that sense, right. not directly, but indirectly. Indirectly. Mm -hmm. Can I have uh, two questions? One yeah. is, uh, one is, one is reborn in the subhuman realm. Mm -hmm. Is there a possibility of going up to the human or above the human? When you say subhuman, meaning below the human, right? Yes. Like animal, yes. Like, uh, hungry ghosts, and hellish ones. Yes. Yeah. Yes. In the suttas, uh, in in the uh, what's known as the uh, Petavatu, the the section on uh, on the hungry ghosts and the section on the Manavatu, which is the section on the devas, uh, it talks about how even people or beings who are hungry ghosts, for example, they're not able to produce their own merit, but people can uh, dedicate their merit to the hungry ghost, and from that merit, the hungry ghost can be reborn as a human, or even a higher uh, being. That's what the notion is. So it's possible for any being un, uh, below the human level to actually come back to the human existence, either through, through the experiencing of the karma that led to that subhuman experience, and then any other karma that arises that leads to a human realm will lead them there. Or that the merit is dedicated to that being and from there they can elevate to a human existence or karma. One more thing is, uh, rebirth uh, would occur in, sorry, in the same gender or a different gender? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good question because sometimes Majority of the time, the, how the suttas explain it, and even I think the Abhinama explains it, is there's actually three kinds of internal faculties. The feminine faculty, the masculine faculty, and the life faculty. And the idea is that if a person has been predominantly masculine, then they will be reborn in a masculine gender, let's say, in a subsequent life. But not always necessarily. It's like, <coughs> you know, nowadays some people identify as a different gender. Yeah. So because of that, it's possible that they could be reborn as that different gender that they identified as. Uh, you wanted to say something? Or? Uh, no, um, <coughs> the point which I had, he, just, uh, he said that, which was that if, you know, that if, uh, that if the brain stem happens to stop working, uh, then in which case all of the sense uh, faculties which we have anywhere uh, are going to fail. So from that, mm -hmm. what is uh, receiving merit from this? I don't understand. Oh, like for example, the idea is that like there's a story of someone who became a hungry ghost. Now this is a story in the suttas, and uh, this hungry ghost uh, was wandering from place to place and you know, unable to satisfy their desires, and then met upon um, a group of sailors. And the Sangri Ghost said, I, I, I made a lot of mistakes, and now, you know, I descended into as a hungry ghost uh, because of all of the things that I've done. Can you please uh, provide dana to the Sangha? and then dedicate that merit to me. So the sailors found a sangha of bhikkhus and bhikkhunis and uh, offered them food and requisites and everything. And the merit that they received, they then dedicated to that yeah. hungry ghost. And then that hungry ghost became a deva. This oh. is what the story says. Is this similar to Hindu mythology, Atma ko shanti dena, if you're Yes, I, I was having a similar thought, yeah. Because many times they say, Atma phita kara hai, Atma is not panting around. You have to dedicate offerings so that they get relieved from that religion. I, I think it's culturally similar. Because the fact that Buddhism or the Buddha or the Bodhisattva was uh, in the Indian <coughs> cultural milieu of things, I think it's it's pretty much similar. Mm -hmm.
factors. Uh, what are the factors of uh, intuition or how does one develop intuition? Yeah. So the factor, uh, the fact, the faculty of intuition, let's say, is basically a mind that is always experiencing insight. It's a mind that is not con not dependent upon always past causes and conditions. It's like it just bypasses the whole process of analysis and reflection. But to bring up that uh, quality of intuition, there's a few things that you need. Number one, you need to have good sila. Always good sila. Keeping your precepts all the time. That way your mind remains in some form collected or at the very least not restless. And then you ask that mind a question. And then you do whatever task it is you're doing. And out of nowhere, seemingly out of nowhere, the mind will come up with an answer. So first you need sila, and then that gives you a mind that is predominantly stable. And then ask the mind a question, and then you get an answer. questions uh, surrounding the deliverance by emptiness and the deliverance by or the sign of deliverance. Mm. Uh, here, you know, the, the answer was a monk goes to a village or a hut and contemplates the sense basis and the experience and the aggregates as not self. And you mentioned that it's similar to the experience yeah. of that is similar to the silence deliverance. But whereas uh, the silence deliverance itself is, can I say it's more through samadhi? Right, it's more through letting go of any objects. There are three samadhis, three categories of samadhis, let's say. Or let's say six categories of samadhis, if you want to more technical. <laughs> there is that which is directed, that which has an object, and that which has a sense of self. There is that which is undirected, that which is um, empty of self, and that which is objectless. And in a sense, those three categories qualitatively okay. point to the same kind of experience. Right. So, uh, you know, do you need any type of uh, jhana, per se, to actually uh, enter the deliverance by emptiness? Yes, you need a mind that's collected. So you need a mind free of hindrances, which is a... Is a is the foundation of being in a jhanic state of mind. Not necessarily you need to be in the first jhana, second jhana, mm. third jhana. Mm. But I would say that it's easier for you to be in the fourth jhana to get to emptiness, to get to mm. a uh, signless state of mind. But not a prerequisite. Not a prerequisite. Right. So here we uh, enter the signless deliverance through the quiet mind. Because that's... Right why you would say it's 8.5, right? right? You know, you, you kind of tie it to the quiet mind. It, yeah. it has the quiet mind as the base. But what other factor uh, leads to the signless elements from the quiet mind? Tranquility. Mm -hmm. Relaxation. Mm -hmm. That's why I say when I give personal instructions to you guys, I say, when you, whoever is in quiet mind, don't do anything. You know, I used to say to people, relax, observe, be attentive, be aware, but I now just say, don't do anything. <laughs> because there's a tendency in the mind to say, oh, he said to observe, so what do I observe? I gotta look for something to observe. Oh, he said to relax. What should I relax into? Oh, he said to be attentive. Where should I put my attention? 
don't do anything. That don't do anything assumes that uh, there are no hindrances. Right. There's enough tranquility. Right. There's. So this is facilitated. I'll just continue with what you were just saying. Yeah, it's facilitated by disenchantment and detachment. Detachment. Remember what I talked about disenchantment. What is disenchantment? Revulsion. Being sick of that thing. Like I've seen enough. Don't care anymore. That's one. This passion is a mind that's in a bubble. I've told the story to a few of you guys in personal interviews. But are you guys familiar with uh, the king Janaka? Janak? Sita's. Yeah, Sita's father. Yeah, okay. He was known to be a Raja Rishi. Of course, now this is not within Buddhist context, but it will give you some insight. He was a Raja Rishi. He was known to be one who was an enlightened king, an awakened king. And uh, Vashish, uh, his son, Sukha, he told his son, go see Janaka to get uh, a good understanding of what Vairagya is, what detachment is, dispassion is. So Sukha went to meet with uh, Janak, and uh, Janak said, okay, I will give you some instructions. He gave him a bowl of oil that was filled to the brim. And he said, go out into the city carrying this bowl of oil. Make sure not one drop of oil falls to the ground while you're walking. Because if it falls, there is a soldier behind you who is ready to chop your head off. So what did he do? He went into the market. There were people selling all of these things. Hey, look at this. Hey, look at that. Half off if you buy two right now. You know, all of these things. Colorful images, dancers, and this and that. Spices, amazing smells. Food sizzling, you know. All of these things. But here he was, paying attention to the bowl of oil. So in your own mind, when you're in quiet mind, in the periphery, there's going to be all of these thoughts and ideas. Hey, look at this. Hey, look at that. But you are okay with just paying attention to this. This is this passion. So there's a similar story of Narada carrying oil because Vishnu asked right. to carry. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Cool. <laughs> I really don't know. My question is uh, related to the like uh, infinite consciousness, infinite space, nothingness, and signless state. These are different for non arahants right? For arahant. Sorry, say the question. Today I got different understanding of the sutra. I just want to clarify that. So it says that these jhanas are different for different in the me, in the meaning. Yeah. It is same for in the case of arahant because yeah. arahant does not see these jhanas as different because no 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 is it like that no 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 they can experience that in different meanings and different names but what that's pointing out to is that they they are categorizing the mind of an arahant. Immeasurable, meaning being able to send loving kindness in all directions, immeasurably, is one kind of thing. But the Arhat's mind is also immeasurable because there is no measure making. Nothingness, it's a jhana, it's a state of meditation. But an Arhat's mind has none of the greed, hatred, and delusion, so it has nothingness there. Emptiness, understanding the emptiness of self, but the Arahant's mind is empty of greed, hatred, and delusion. Signless, because there's no object there. 
but the arat's mind is free of any objects of greed, hatred, and delusion. So an arat can experience all of these states, the emptiness, liberation, liberation through nothingness, loving kindness, immeasurable, but it's pointing to the quality of an arat as well. In that way they are synonymous. Thanks for this clarification. I read this sutta many times, but I didn't catch this one. <laughs> and I just want to comment on the ayu and heat. Mm -hmm. I am not a medical expert, but I heard this from another monk. Uh, heat is heat, and ayu is uh, metabolism. So when we eat food, and that food need to be converted as an energy. So when that when food is when the process of converting food to energy is metabolism. During that process, heat is generated. Mm -hmm. So whatever the food we eat, like it will digest and some heat is generated. And oh, to carry out this metabolism process, heat is mandatory. Mm -hmm. If there is no heat, there is metabolism does not work. Mm -hmm. So in the case of somebody who died, their heat is dissipated. So there is no metabolism process goes mm -hmm. on. But somebody who entered into Nirvana, they can, in their body, the metabolism and heat is going on. Mm -hmm. That's why you lost your weight. <laughs> <laughs> That That's my understanding. My, I heard this from uh, Bhante Purnaji. Ah, yes. Good. But I, I would still uh, stick to Venerable Sir's explanation that the Buddha days were different and today's days are far way different. So maybe it's a debate whether to compare those yeah. things actually. My question is a bit very general. What are the views of Buddhism on three things? One is entertainment, specifically dancing and singing to that context, that those days. Two, physical exercises. Three, charity. See, uh, why I ask this? Because uh, we are, I mean, precepts say not to indulge in singing, dancing, one. There is no specific mention of any physical exercise as in other Indian traditions like, say, doing yoga or any physical exercises. And number three, charity. Uh, the the uh, empathy factor which was mentioned, they said do have compassion, but you do not take them out of their suffering. The yesterday's story that uh, the person was having a lot of pain and he was burning of pain, he was uh, given a story and he got uh, <clears throat> near that, but he was not helped per se. So what are the views on charity for other human beings as far as Buddhism is concerned in present day context, be it financial or whatever exercise we do these days. So these three things, entertainment, physical exercise and charity. Okay, first entertainment. In Damasukha, we used to go out for movies, didn't we? No, the idea is that uh, for monastics, um, you know, going to live shows, theater shows, and watching dancing and all of that, that was just uh, time better spent in meditation, contemplation, and study. But for lay people, there's no injunction that they can't go out for shows and, you know, watch live theater shows or movies and things like that. When you're in the context of a retreat setting, the idea is that you want to be uh, concentrated on your fo on your practice. So, you know, we keep the precept for not watching shows and things like that. There's a lack of physical activity, absolutely. I mean, uh, the Buddha was understood to have, he woke up in the morning, first thing he did was, you know, after washing up and everything, he did an hour or so of walking meditation. That's kind of like a physical activity. And uh, then he radiated compassion to all beings for a couple of hours and then started his day and stuff like that. And uh, so in terms of physical exercise, absolutely, you can do yoga. 
you could do stretching, you could do running. In fact, one of the things we tell you as you're starting to sit for longer periods of time is to walk up and down the stairs to get the blood moving. Right? And then come and sit. So, absolutely, do whatever physical exercise you'd like to do. Just don't overdo it. And charity. So, this is a very important co component of the Dhamma. This is, this is generosity. Dhamma. Which is... Now, you mentioned yesterday the Anapendika story, where Sariputta helped. He actually did help him. He understood that this man was suffering, and he let him go, let his mental suffering go. He did help him in that sense. The highest dana that you can give is the dana of dana. There is different expositions in this sutta, actually a specific exposition that talks about charity whether it's financial, or providing food, providing shelter, to uh, people who, who need it, right? And it talks about how the, give, the giver of whatever it is being given, his mind is pure, their mind is purified, and the receiver, if they accept it with loving kindness and gratitude, their mind is purified. And then it goes into higher things like, you know, if you give it to somebody who's a stream enter, give it to somebody who's a, a, a one returner, a non returner, and an arahant. And what if an arahant gives to another arahant? Is there any merit that's created? You know, all of those things go into it. So the idea is that uh, there is big emphasis on generosity in, in the Dhamma. And uh, that charity that we talk about is in helping people with medical supplies helping people, you know, who, who require food, shelter. Um, so, this should not be overlooked, the charity aspect. It's, 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 it's a vital aspect of sila, samadhi, and panya. So, sila, and dana, and samadhi, and that leads to panya. So the more, the more someone is generous, this is the understanding of this, the more someone is generous, their mind becomes more purified through that process of giving to one who requires something. And because of that, their mind becomes stable, and it's easier for their mind to go into samadhi. Yeah. Also, which one? Ah, uh, This is Sutta number 142, Majjhima Nikaya 142, Dakina Vipanga Sutta, the exposition of offerings. Also, by the way, Sariputta was known to be somebody who actually helped those who were in, sick as well. So in, if somebody was sick at the monastery or whatever, he'd be the one who'd make sure that they were taking their medicines, he'd be the one making sure they were well rested, if they had open sores, he would clean that, bathe them, all of these things. So, absolutely, it's important to help your fellow persons. Yeah, when I talk about that, I'm referring to not being a crutch because sometimes somebody is, uh, you know, in suffering and then you, you, you're there to help them, but they can take advantage of you and then you become a crutch for them. And that's a very toxic relationship. This is what I'm referring to. Oh, it's back with me. <laughs> Wait, I think that I don't know another one to add something before you go on. Oh yeah, just on the... Uh training principle or the, the precept of entertainment and shows the spirit of that, you know, off retreat would just be not to uh, overindulge and, um, you know, basically don't fuel your mind with, with mental junk food. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of an oversimplification, but in the same way that like a, a high calorie uh, nutrient deprived diet is bad for your body, you have like high dopamine like, uh, you know, low, low value kind of mental inputs, you know, in whatever form that takes, whether it's like, a, you know, some juicy clickbait or something like that, 
that's going to leave a lot of some scars and different um, ideas floating around in your head that might make it harder to meditate. It might be a lot more a lot more six Ring when you sit down. So the the idea is to kind of like minimize or at least be mindful about what you're consuming with your uh, with your mind. So just just uh, based on what he just said, uh, this is something I was telling you, which is what we're doing is oh I'm sorry, telling you, which is what we were doing, which is what we're doing in retreat is it's a dopamine detox. You're not with your phone, can't check your emails, you're not on social media, you're not checking Netflix. You're relaxing and letting go. So it's a kind of dopamine the detox as well. I think that would be fair to say. Yeah, yeah. That's the, the low information diet. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good point, and you know, also with regards to exercise and diet, if you if you think about the intention behind why a lot of people are like working out of the gym, uh, I mean, to be kind of cynical, it might be more about outer appearances. You know, it's more about how do I look good and how do I, um, yeah, how do I be like sexually attractive, or it might be to extend their life, uh, which is a little more wholesome, but. If your intention is just like I want to feel good, I want to be healthy, then you know that's very different. And same thing with diet. You know, if you're trying to, if it's all about how you look in the meal in the mirror versus how much energy you have, how good you feel, how much joy you're generating for yourself, then like that's a very different intention. Uh, yeah, very good. But didn't you have a question? And uh, looks like Mr. Neo from the Matrix. I know. <laughs> <laughs> he speaks like it sometimes too. <laughs> uh, speaking about music, that's something that I have thought about over the different years. And a few years, some years back, when I was more into learning about neuroscience and things, and I began exploring it more as far as just information going into the different strata of the brain and I began being more aware of, of what I would ingest but then in the past years as I've had different solitary retreats for weeks and months where I basically had no external interactions I've been amazed at how songs will come up long after people's voices come up you know if I had arguments or whatever those go in the days or weeks, but songs, they just keep coming up. And 
it's amazing. It's it's really opened my eyes. Partly, I think, just as it purifies the mind, I, I listen to less music. I just find less attraction in it. But also having those sorts of experiences definitely give me pause before I intentionally listen to anything because it seems like it's at the very lower parts of the brain that's just looping down there unconsciously or something. And I haven't looked into it as much. Maybe y'all have more insight as far as... I mean, there is something magical about music. Obviously, it exists all over the world, and we have things like OM that you know are, are base of sound and base of existence and things, but it seems like there's something more powerful with music than just with the spoken word or with the read word or something like that. And so, as much as it's not currently practiced in our society because it's garbage music is just everywhere, all over, but it seems like it should be something that we should be much more aware of. Yeah, I, I want to say something about that a little bit, about... Um you know, for example, you were talking about how sometimes in meditation you'll just hear like a song that you've heard from the past and it just loops like you were talking about. So obviously the way to do that is to say sorry, but I have a musician friend of mine who talked to me about this and they said that, uh, uh, you know, the best way to let go of or to stop that whole process, they call it earworm, just always going on and on and on, is to actually listen to that song. <laughs> To actually consciously listen to that song, so play it on the radio or play it on whatever, and hear it, and then it just goes away. So you might want to try that, see how it works. Yeah. Also, so I kind of think about these kind of there's like cultural memes that are basically mind viruses, and they can infect an entire population. And songs can be forms of that, where it's just like. It's like a bit of code that can just enter people's heads and it becomes this mantra almost, you know. And um, also a funny anecdote, a little, a little off topic, but on my first uh, Goenka retreat, I had this song stuck in my head. I'm a little embarrassed. It was uh, Skater Boy by Avril Lavigne. <laughs> Wouldn't leave my head for some reason. I haven't listened to it in, in years. But uh, at the end of the retreat, I was... You know, we'd circled up with the people in the retreat, and I was telling them about this, and I was like, you know, there's this song that was stuck in my head. And this other kid who was about my age said, me too, I uh, skater boys. <laughs> <laughs> so go figure. But have you noticed that how, like, maybe the older generation would know this, like how they feel like their music, the music of their generation, is so much better, and all of the music over here is trash. That's another kind of clinging to view, right? <laughs> clinging to ideas. Like, the music of our generation was great. There was somebody uh, on retreat, actually, uh, in one of the Dhamma Sutra retreats, asked me, or they said, you know, I'm a big fan of Star Wars. They knew I was a big fan of Star Wars. And they said, you know, the original trilogy was really great, but the sequel trilogy is terrible. And I said, that's clinging to view. <laughs> but sorry, you were talking about the music, Samuel. So you. I was just curious if you all have any insight as far as it going into deeper parts of the brain or operating in some way to where it is stronger than you know. If I were to say the same words to you versus you were to hear them in a song, I was to sing them to you, and those lasting or being more powerful in some way. Do you have anything to say about that? I mean, yeah, I'm definitely, I'm definitely not an expert on that, but I would say that the memories that are the stickiest often have some kind of emotional salience to them. So because music can evoke strong emotions, there might be a saliency factor there where the mind hangs on to it stronger. In your experience, just as in your evolution, do you listen to the same amount of music, less music? I'm just curious. For me, no lyrics. Yeah. yeah. For the most part. But even, and even that, I found for me personally, like it started maybe three years ago with no lyric, maybe five years ago, no lyric music. But even now, I really, I don't even really want to listen to that much. Yeah, and I don't as a monk, but 
<laughs> Good city. <laughs> I can't remember the last time I consciously made the effort to listen to music. Yeah. I've found, some time. Yeah. especially in the past, maybe, I guess this year, maybe before, I've been more aware of the initial unconscious movement towards turning music on and this story in my mind of, oh yeah, I want to hear music because I'm just so used to hearing music because it's everywhere. But then I will pause and I will reflect and I'll be like, actually, I'm feeling really good right now and I don't really want to hear music. Yeah. Because music is interesting because it, it does evoke so many different kinds of emotions, right? It can, it, and you can tie a certain kind of memory to that music. And then when you listen to that same music, it un packs that same kind of memory. So I think it's because it probably does hit certain kinds of centers in the brain that evoke emotion. Because something that is emotional, you are able to remember uh, more easily than something without emotion. Right. At least this is the way I would, I mean, that's how I speculate it might be. It is taking you away from the present uh, reality, if you are listening to music. Mm -hmm. You are not with what is happening with you. Yeah, but again, I, I don't want to demonize listening to music. It's not like you can't listen to music. I'm just saying this is what could happen when you're listening to music. But if you're listening to music for enjoyment or relaxation, just like you would watch a TV show for relaxation, I don't see anything wrong with it. It would be interesting to know how people's musical taste change as they start meditating more, because yeah. I know for me, Again, this is before I ordained. I have tried to, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, like suddenly what I thought was really energizing before was suddenly full of craving attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I might notice that. Also, there's a beautiful chant across various religions and yeah. cultures. Oh yeah, yeah. They're also very uplifting. You know, even in, even with the uh, the Pali chants, right? Sometimes uh, I've heard uh, monastics sing it in a, or in a very sing-songy kind of way, chanting the Pali uh, Pali suttas or or chants. So I think there's some power there too. You know, you hear the different mantras and the different chanting of the different religions. Yeah, there's something to be said about that, but. Again, you know, when we talk about music, it's it is for for the for the monastics that they have to be more aware of what it is that they put into their minds, and you know, be more aware in terms of the cultivation of samadhi. Likewise, for lay people, uh, it's all about that. Like, what kind of music are you listening to, and what is the intention behind listening to that music, and uh, are you aware of the quality of your mind and thoughts that arise when you listen to a certain type of music as well. Uh, I had a comment on the psychedelics. Um, I noticed that when I did a, a, a very large dose of shrooms in Amsterdam, the experience, or I, I had an experience with Twim where I was like, whoa, that was just like mm -hmm. Just like the shrooms. And then uh, lately, when I get into quiet mind, it's like everything is flashing. Like my, my visual field is flashing. My, the ringing in my ear is, it's not just a tone, it's a flashing. And then the sensation in my body, it's like my whole body is flashing. And that felt just like ayahuasca. So that was pretty interesting. And um, then my question was. Uh, so as, as people are going through the different stages of enlightenment or awakening, um, and, and you do that by doing cessations, how come, for example, if someone gets uh, first path and then they get second path, wouldn't they have gotten the hang of it where they just kind of like coast on Coast along to our house ship, like, oh yeah, just, just do that again and just get it real quick. Yeah, you would think that, wouldn't you? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so tomorrow I'm going to be reading from Majjhima Nikaya 44, which talks about contact with the Nibbana element and what happens after that. It's all about the input that leads to what happens in terms of the output. So it is a consistent effort of using the Eightfold Path. That's why it is entry into the path, then the fruition, and then re-entry into the path, and then fruition, until it becomes second nature. And then one quick question, or maybe quick, is uh, I noticed it's it's hard to get into first jhana now, or the earlier jhanas. It's like, I'll try and say I want to go into one of the earlier jhanas, and I just go straight to equanimity, and I can't. That's the only thing I can do. Uh, is there an antidote to that? Well, I can give you an analogy for why why I think it works that way, because that's that's very normal, and I don't. Yeah, you might notice that it creates a little tension in the mind to try to be an earlier jhana, and it's kind of like there's water at the top of a mountain that wants to flow down because of gravity, and let's say in the first jhana you like you carved a path down to this pool where the water's pooling, and that's the first jhana. But then eventually there's a, it finds a way down to a second pool, which is the second jhana, and so forth, all the way down to quiet mind. Now that that, now that, that ridge has been carved all the way down, the water just wants to go to the, the low gravity point where there's the least tension, the least craving in the mind. So it'll just go there very quickly because you've conditioned. Because, uh, it, it, yeah, the mind doesn't want to suffer, right? So it's, uh, it's PLT, right? Yeah, the, the point of lowest tension, we call it. And so, is it a process of just like re establishing like a different route that doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to go back to the first job? Yeah, yeah, like to make a, a new pool. <laughs> right, yeah. <clears throat> Ski on some fresh tracks or something. Yeah, maybe. Um, That's a good question. I don't know, because I think when you get further in retreat... Uh, yeah. I would just say when you're on retreat, don't worry about getting to lower jhanas. You want to always just get to that point where you get to quiet mind. The quicker you get to quiet mind, the better. And then later on, you will start to develop your ability to come back to the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. It, it, it will become easier for you to be able to do that. But it, you know, people uh, should be happy if they're getting a quiet mind and equanimity and these higher, more refined states because that's that's much closer. Let's say I'm not saying it's closer in terms of distance, but it's just easier for the mind to let go from there. Back to singing and dancing. Uh, you know, uh, he mentioned that people in during their days of the Buddha somewhat different to what we are now. But even in the Mahapari Nibbana Sutta, yeah. right, there are people dancing and singing in front of the, the, the body of the Buddha. Mm -hmm. And it happens even today if you go to South India. So it's a bit like you, you send that person happily to, <laughs> <laughs> to wherever they are going. Uh, and, and, and I think even on a very general level, we're not so different to to any of these people that you meet in the suttas. It's just that you know, if you have a Buddha in front of you who has such special conditions, and you hear from that Buddha, you just go to that place much faster, like what you're saying, and you just zoom through the sensations. <laughs> And, and, and you know, the other thing is, uh, I think once Dalai Lama mentioned, because he meets a, a lot of these scientists, the, ne the neuroscientists, he mentions that uh, in the last, from the, from the last thousand years or so, we have kind of lost our ability to memorize things. We lost our ability to yeah. uh, put our attention on stuff longer than, uh, I mean, we're not, we're not having that attention. So there is a, 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 a brain component to our evolution, especially you know, yeah. the last
last uh, thousand years or so, but I don't think we are much different. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what I would say about that is like, <clears throat> what I would say about that is that um, You know, one of the things I had mentioned earlier a long time back, uh, relatively, was that, you know, if you take somebody from the Buddha's time and you just drop them into the 20th, 21st century, they, their head would explode. Because <laughs> there is so much hyper-stimulation that we are experiencing. So there is something to be said about the fact that they had less stimulation going on. And uh, they had more free time on their hands to be able to do these things. <laughs> and attend Dhamma talks and you know all of these kinds of things. Um, but you know, yeah, about that, that's an interesting point too, because there used to be a time where like, you know, when I while I was still living in India, for example, I would ask my grandfather, all right, how do I get to this place? And he would say, Okay, you take this number of bus to this bus station. And then you'll come to this Hanuman Mandir, and then you make a left from there, and then you take a right from there. And I was able to retain all of that and be like, okay, yeah, I see the Hanuman Mandir there, take a left. And when you see that shop, if you go if you go that shop, you've gone too far, there's a gully that side. You remember all of these things, but now with like Google Maps and you know all of that, it's like you don't need to. You used to remember, I used to remember as a kid all of the phone numbers of my of my friends. There's no need to now, so that's interesting. Yeah, I don't think our brain has evolved very much in the last 2,500 years. Uh, that's that's not a lot of time, but they do say that in the last 30,000 years it's shrunk a bit. Um, but uh, but I think it's most of it's that program B that I talked about, just a lifetime of conditioning, short of attention span. And then also the brain is just trying to conserve energy at any possible turn. So if we can outsource knowledge, like Delson said, to our phone, then like why remember is just going to use that energy somewhere else. Um, but what's kind of cool is I think I think you can still train these abilities. And there's one example where Viktor Frankl, who was a Holocaust victim, he was in this isolate, uh, you know, isolated. Um, what they call it, uh, you know, an, an isolated cell for a while, and he just started to develop this incredible memory because there was no input coming in, and he actually said that he wrote his entire book there in his mind before he came out and wrote uh, Man's Search for Meaning. So I think it's still accessible. I don't think we've devolved at all. I think there's hope. <laughs> Is not really defined. But the fact is that 
at the time of the death, the, clinically the body may be dead, but there are a lot of cases where the body remains very fresh, yes. alive. Yes. I mean, even in Dharamshala also, I know the case. The teacher of uh, His Holiness, he passed away. His body remained totally fresh for 13 days. Right. And it, it was kept there. So what is that? Which really is in that? Even I think, uh, uh, what is this book, the Autobiography of Yogi, yes. you read. Yes. There Perhaps also, there. yeah, he passed away in San, uh, San Francisco, called it California. Yeah. And the doctor, the American doctor, he certified. Yeah. His photo is there in that book. I think for 18 days or 21 days it remained alive. So the question is that, what is that vital energy which is really keeping that body yeah. alive? Yeah. So that is one. And the second question is that, if the organs are not really working, if it's already dead, how that vital energy is really sustaining those dead uh, 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 senses or that dead body? So you're saying in the case of the dead body, the vital organs are non-functional? No, I'm saying that in the case of the normal phys physical body, it's dead, it is not functioning. Right. But the vital part is still working, if we call it that, and still the body gets that energy, it doesn't decay. Right. How did that really that happen? Right. So I think... Uh, so I'm going to uh, posit... Uh, I think Something this is that that probably, come. I think the doctors may have some... Yeah, I think maybe they might yeah. have some... Do you, want, do you guys want to do some input on this? <laughs> I, I do want to posit uh, the, the process of dying the way I've understood it. And this could be in complete... Uh, completely medically not sound what I'm going to say, but I can say it from my contemplation, so take it for what it's worth to you guys. The way I've understood the dying process is that the, the elements or the four great elements of the body unravel in a certain kind of sequence. In my understanding, first the air element starts to dissipate. Then the fire element starts to dissipate. It might still be present, it starts to dissipate. Then the water element, and then finally the earth element, the solidity of the body starts to dissipate. In conjunction with that, the six sense bases also unravel in a certain sequence. The way I have understood this is that first the sense of smell goes away. And then the sense of taste goes away. Then the sense of sight, then the sense of touch, then the sense of hearing, and finally the mind sense. Based on that, the way I would look at it is that the mind is still functional in that kind of clinically dead body. Which is why I would posit that when you are with your loved ones, and uh, even after they are clinically dead, don't start weeping right away. Yeah. Because the hearing is still going on. And you could chant mantras, you could uh, chant whatever it is you want to chant, or just be grateful for them and, you know, kind of guide them to a better existence. Make them feel uplifted. And the way I posit is, again, the body seems to be clinically dead. What I posit is that from one and a half hours to even longer than that, the mind faculty is still present. And so the mind faculty be, would be the thing that's probably keeping the freshness of that body. Yeah, I think uh, what you're saying is correct. But uh, at least the Tibetan Buddhism, 
the dissolution of the body is the opposite in the sense the first earth then uh, uh, water then uh, 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 heat and then and air yeah. and spirits that is and it's also correct that most of the teachers particularly the Tibetan Buddhism they said that at least for three days if possible the body should be kept as it is without disturbing because the connection though it may be dead but still the the mind is uh, getting connected to the body it's only on the third day the consciousness realizes that it is separated from the body yeah. yeah and very correct i think that's why they do a lot of uh, chanting mantras yeah So essentially what I had to ask was about the um, real world advice about, uh, you know, uh, what's the right way to uh, help uh, bring someone to the the uh, Dhamma. Uh, like in the sense, uh, I have friends or, you know, I, I, I know friends who fall into one of two buckets. Like one of them is that everything is going well and right in life. Like, you know, they're, they're doing well work-wise, everything is going fine. Why should I change anything? Uh, and uh, you know, I have heard things that, like in fact, one of my uh, um, colleagues, he was saying that he probably wouldn't want to start any of this at least for the next the, uh, um, 20 odd years. <laughs> and the uh, other bucket which I've seen has been that uh, you know that uh, they're not really you know, they're not really doing well, and you know they're maybe going through um, something, but. Um, uh, they don't see this. Uh, uh, the, uh, they don't see dhamma as uh, what is going to solve their troubles, and uh, I am not really so um, articulate uh, that you know uh, I could probably give them you know like um, dhamma talk, which would you know say <laughs> so. so. Uh, so that's uh, you know. So uh, what's the best way to deal with this in life? And, don't. <laughs> the reason is because uh, we don't evangelize, or at least I don't evangelize, or we try not to evangelize. The idea is that when somebody wants to come to the Dhamma, they will come to the Dhamma, and then your example, you, you know, you leading by example. So a lot of times people will approach a person who's like, even in like really, uh, stressful situations, this person seems to be very calm and able to deal with the situation in a practical way. What's going on with them? My, my friend and my assistant who works at Microsoft, uh, he was saying, you know, oftentimes, you know, at the meetings it will get really heated and he'll just remain in equanimity. And oftentimes the managers will come to him and ask, what's, what's going on with you? How, how are you being able to be so calm? And they say, well, I do this practice and things like that. And now he's starting to give full-blown Dhamma talks to those guys. <laughs> <laughs> so let them approach you or let them see like, okay, there's something up about this. Or, hey, I heard you were doing meditation, so what is that all about? Can you tell me? So wait for that opportunity. too much time today. You know, uh, just continuing on that, the very reason why this being is sitting here is because she saw the way I handled my, my father's uh, medical condition and his passing away. And she asked me once, hey, you know, are you you're going for this retreat? Can I come? I, I didn't actually respond much to it. Because, you know, that's just the initial intention. Yeah. She asked me the second time. And yes, that's yeah. when uh, uh, you know she she. That's when I understood that she's actually being serious with this. So uh, there is some merit to not sharing too much information at, at the onset and just letting them <coughs> be aware that you are in this process, and then they come back to you again. It's, but I I've, I've seen cases where I I've shared more information than. Uh, what I should not, <laughs> and they just walk in. <laughs> and, 
and you know, on uh, on dying, that you mentioned that uh, the ear organ, uh, the ear base, uh, goes last to the mind. So that's very interesting uh, because I kept whispering to my father mm -hmm. uh, like two days before he he was about to pass away. I told him, you know, you know, he was in a semi-conscious state. He he could not. Understand much what's happening, but I would ask him, can you can you hear me? Can you recognize me? And then you go back to a, a semi-conscious state. And then a uh, month before that, he kept he kept telling you know it's time for me to move on, you know, just inform everybody and all that. And I told him, you know, did you say that? And I was not at home. And then he said, oh, no, no, I may have said something in confusion. I didn't even say that. I don't know. Uh, then I told him, you know, I will tell you when the time comes. Uh, and then two days before, you know, she was at home. Uh, I had a, a silent moment with him and I said, don't hold on to anything. Mm -hmm. Whatever you see, it's just seeing. Whatever you sense, it's just sensing. Whatever you think, it's just thinking. And I didn't know that whether he heard it or not. But I heard it from my uh, brother that he said, you know, just leave me alone, guys. You know, don't give me anything. Mm -hmm. Just leave me. And then uh, on the day he was about to pass away, uh, I actually played the Ratha Sutta. I didn't know all this, like the ear organ uh, functions. But it's interesting. Uh, that, that was the last thing that he heard. But by what you're saying, the mind could still function for few more hours or a few more days, like what the Tibetan tradition says. Yeah, it takes you to interesting places to come. Well, and then what I would say about that is that the hearer faculty would still function even after the body is clinically dead. Yeah. There have been cases, or I've, I've, somewhere in some research paper or some stories about where people who have had near-death experiences, for example, can be seen floating around, seeing what's going on, or hearing you know, their loved ones and everything like that, and then coming back and reporting exactly what it is that they saw and heard. So yeah, I mean, yeah, even while the person is passing away, but even after they're clinically dead, if you continue uh, chanting or giving good advice or lifting them up, that's still helpful. So if you ever feel like you are not there in time, to actually give them good words of advice before they left doesn't mean that time is done. You can still, you can still talk to them. So very awesome. Yes. You know, there's still some time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyone else? Good. Let's share some there. Suffering ones, be suffering free, and fear struck fearlessly. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's disease. Sad. Sad.